Hello and welcome to the third webinar in the Southwestern College Distance Education webinar series. My name is Tracy Shalin and I am the DE Faculty Coordinator at Southwestern College. Today we're going to be talking about regular effective contact and regular and substantive interaction. Before we get started though, just a note to those of you watching the video archive of this webinar. Due to technical difficulties, I have re-recorded the first 20 or so minutes of the webinar uh, to, so that you don't have to listen to us addressing those technical difficulties. And then um, we will switch over to the originally recorded archive about 20 minutes in. So today we're going to be talking about requirements. Yay! Requirements! You're all jumping up and down just like this girl here, aren't you? Well, these requirements are actually good for our students. So these are requirements that we want to pay attention to and we want to integrate into our courses. We're talking here about regular effective contact and regular and substantive interaction. And although these are different terms, they really are the same idea. The reason that we have these two different phrasings is because they come from different agencies. So the ACCJC definition, uh, which aligns with the U.S. Department of Education, uses regular and substantive interaction. And as you can see from the parts that I've highlighted on this slide, that is embedded in the definition of a distance education course, as opposed to a correspondence course, which does not have that regular substantive interaction between the instructor and the student. So according to the ACJC, this is one of the key differences between a correspondence course and a distance education course. Title V and the California Community College Chancellor's Office use slightly different language. The highlighted section here, all approved courses offered as distance education include regular effective contact between the instructor and the students. So this is basically saying the same thing, just using slightly different wording. And one thing to keep in mind when we're talking about regular effective contact, this applies to distance education courses, and that includes any course that is offered partially or fully online. So our courses that are offered 100% online are distance education courses, and so are our hybrid courses. Whether you have a hybrid course that's 50% online, 50% on ground, or some other percentage, anytime you have a class that is offered partially online, it does qualify as a distance education course and does fall under these guidelines which means that if you have a hybrid course for the online portion, you need to have regular effective contact in the online portion, just as you would in the face-to-face -face portion. So I thought we would start by looking at some statistics from our college. The first slide we're looking at is course completion rate, so the percentage of students that complete their courses. And this study is looking at fall 2010 through spring 2014. And you'll notice that the face-to-face -face courses have a much higher completion rate than the online courses. And you'll notice that hybrid is somewhere in the middle, actually a little bit higher, closer to the face-to-face. Now keep that spread in mind as we look at one more slide, which is looking at the success rate. So this is the same time period, and we are looking at how uh, many of these students were succeeding by the time they got to the end of the course. They finished with a C or better. And again, the face-to-face -face students have the strongest success rate. The online courses have the lowest success rate, and the hybrid is somewhere in the middle. So. These local um, charts represent what we see on a larger scale throughout the state of California. So if you were to look at these, um, these numbers for other colleges as well as for our whole system, you would find something very similar in terms of online versus hybrid versus face-to-face. -face. So why is that? This is a question a lot of people are asking. And I think we really should pay attention to 
what the face-to-face -face students have that the others don't. They have more face time. They have interaction with their instructor. And sometimes online students don't get enough interaction to stay with the course and to get the help they need to do well in the course. They feel disconnected. So what if we could find a way to bring more face time to our online students? Would more contact with them improve these rates? I think it might. Let's look at what research says. According to the 2013 Distance Education Report, which is published by the Chancellor's Office, there's a very interesting review in here of 20 different studies. They've been compiled together and the goal was to identify factors that were the keys to persistence. And in this situation, persistence is defined as the successful completion of an online course despite barriers. So students who were able to overcome their challenges to complete their courses. And take a look at these five keys to persistence. Think about how many of these can be impacted by instructor contact. Satisfaction with online learning. A sense of belonging to a learning community. Even time management skills. We can certainly uh, help our students with their time management skills. And then of course the fifth one, increased communication with the instructor. Now the third one, that's one that's kind of difficult for us to have an impact. Um, the, the peer and family support is, as we know, a factor in students not completing courses or not doing as well as they could. But that one is largely out of our control. However, the others, the other four out of these five, are ones that regular contact with the instructor could impact. If you're interested in reading more about this study, the source of it is down here at the bottom of the slide. So it is discussed in the DE report of 2013, and the original source of this information is from Carolyn Hart, and you could look that up if you're interested in learning more. So this is a one piece of research, but I think an equally important piece of research is what our students tell us. And that's what my next slide has for you. Every semester I survey my students at several points during the class, and I thought I would take some of their feedback to me, take some of their answers in the survey, and put them in a Wordle. So if you haven't used Wordle before, it's a computer program that takes all of the typed comments and organizes them, as you can see here, the bigger the text, the more often that word was used. So I took out all the little filler words and words that were specific to our class and put the rest of them in Wordle. And what came out, I think, is really interesting. So I asked students, what do you value most in your online courses? And the biggest response was interaction. Now, it's not clear here if that's interaction with other students or with the instructor, but I think the idea that interaction is so valued by these students is something we really need to pay attention to. And the next biggest uh, item here is feedback. So feedback was the word that was used the most after interaction. And feedback, of course, is really a kind of interaction, right? So students want to have a connection with their instructor, with their peers. They want to know how they're doing. They want somebody to give them some feedback on the work that they're doing because online learners are working in isolation usually. And so that feedback is more important than ever. So I thought next we would talk about some tools that we could use to boost regular effective contact. So hopefully everybody is convinced at this point of its importance, but using it in an online class is a little more complicated than using it in a face-to-face -face class. So in a face-to-face -face class, we naturally interact with our students. We do it at the begin of, beginning of class, we do it at the end of class, and we do it throughout the class, right? If we're giving a mini lecture, we stop, we ask them for feedback, we answer questions, we ask questions and the students respond to us. We are interacting with them throughout a class. If they are working in small groups, we are circulating through the classroom, meeting with each group and discussing their ideas. So it's, it's a very natural interaction on ground 
So online, as you know, is a slightly different situation and we really have to plan ahead a bit more to make sure that that regular effective contact happens. So I thought we would spend a, a few minutes today talking about some of the more obvious tools that you can use and then maybe some you haven't thought about too. So here are some tools that you could use for regular effective contact. The first one that most people think of and most people use is announcements. So every time that you are posting an announcement for your students, you are communicating with them. Maybe you're introducing the focus of the new week. Maybe you're giving the whole class feedback on their performance in the week before. Or maybe you're clarifying something that they found confusing last week. Uh, maybe you are reteaching something halfway through the week after seeing a lot of students were confused. So announcements are a natural way to um, provide that contact for your students. But announcements tend to be one way. So by themselves, they aren't going to be enough for regular effective contact, which is where discussions come in. That is another one that most people think of. So the discussion board has long been a part of online learning. And to use it as a tool for regular effective contact, the key is that you are interacting with your students in those discussions. So setting up discussions for your students and then walking away does not count as regular effective contact because you are not interacting with them. However, if you set up a discussion, you have students post their ideas, resp respond to each other, and then you are in there responding to them as well, that counts as a discussion, that counts as regular effective contact. So it's kind of similar to what you would do in the classroom. You would circulate around the classroom meeting with group after group, giving a few ideas, asking a few leading questions, and then moving on to the next group. Think about that technique in the online environment. So you might read somebody's post and you might say, that's a really interesting idea. Have you thought about? And then give them the next step to think about and then walk away. Or maybe you see two or three students who are all discussing the same idea and you could contribute a post that ties those different ideas together. So there are different ways to do it, but the key is that you are in there participating with the students. And that makes discussions much more rewarding for us anyway, right? Because we aren't just reading what our students have said, but we're actually discussing these ideas with them. We love our discipline, we love the topics we teach, and this is a really rewarding experience to be able to engage with our students um, about the, the topics that we love. So for regular effective contact, discussion boards is a major way to uh, build that into your course as long as you are discussing with them. There's some other things on the list too. Uh, blogs, wikis, uh, both of these are tools within uh, Blackboard and so you could set either one of these up and have the students contribute responses to each other. You could come in and contribute responses as well. Um, then there are some third-party tools that are also really great for regular effective contact. I'm going to be briefly showing you VoiceThread and Padlet in a few minutes. And then the last one here on the list is journals. I've been using journals recently and I really like it. Um, I set my journals to be private, so only the student and me get to access them. And I ask them questions that encourage self-evaluation, like what went really well for you in that last paper? What are your goals for the next one? Or how do you feel halfway through the semester? What are your remaining goals? Or what's the one thing you really think you need to work on? And as they answer those questions, I can see their thought process. I can see what they're proud of, what they're worried about, and I can give them resources to help them achieve the goals that they mention. If they're struggling with a concept or with a skill and they talk about it in their journal, I can give them a link to a website that will help them. I can ask them to have a meeting with me. I can clarify a concept that they're confused about. And nobody else in the class sees that unlike the discussion board. So I think journals are a great way to, um, to strengthen that one-on-one -on -one relationship with the students and make sure that each one of them is getting that interaction with me. Moving to the next column, feedback on student work does count for regular effective contact as long as it is detailed and timely. So a quiz that Blackboard grades automatically does not count. But a paper that you are writing responses 
for your students. You are, you are giving feedback. Uh, maybe you are recording a video giving feedback. All of those would count as regular effective contact. Giving feedback in other areas too. It doesn't necessarily have to be on a paper. It could be feedback as they're working on a project. It could be feedback um, in the discussion. Online study sessions are another option. You could use CCC Confer. Uh, other popular tools are Skype and Google Hangout. And again, the key is that you are in that space working with your students. And lastly, contacting students by email, phone, chat, etc., etc., also counts for regular effective contact. Email would be the biggest of those, of course. But because outside auditors cannot see things like email between instructor and students, we have to keep a record of those things. So it is our responsibility to archive our email, phone, etc. records in the case of an audit. If you're wondering how much regular effective contact is enough to meet these state and federal guidelines, a good rule of thumb is how much time would you spend with these students if it were a face-to-face -face class? You should be spending the same amount of time interacting with them online. So if your class meets for three hours a week in the on-ground format, you would spend three hours a week interacting with your students in the online format. Okay, so now we're going to dive into some specific visual examples of a few of these tools so that you can see what they're like, try them out, and we can discuss how they might be used. And for those of you who are watching the video recording of this, this is the point at which we are switching back to the original CCC Confer archive. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to throw up a couple of examples here from within Blackboard. So what I have here is just a few announcements from a typical week. And this is from um, a class that I'm teaching right now, actually. So I thought, okay, I'll just take the most recent three announcements. You can see the first one is Monday, September 7th. And I, I think even though this is kind of a random pulling of announcements, they do get to some of the things we were talking about. So the first post up at the top is on week two's discussion grades. And so even though I joined my students in the discussion, I gave feedback there, I'm using an announcement to reinforce some of what we were talking about that, in that discussion to emphasize key things. And then I also give them some information about how they were graded, where they can find the rubric for the week's discussion, and so on. The one underneath that is uh, the one that was posted several days earlier, and that was an introduction to our new area of study. And so my class is world literature, and I try to give it a world travel theme. So I'm always showing them pictures of where we're going and saying things like, pack your bags, to kind of get them excited about armchair traveling. The last one, in this screenshot is uh, an announcement about an ebook version of our textbook. And so I've added a link there. They can click on that to go um, see the new ebook that accompanies our book. So they're just a variety of different things, but the nice thing about those announcements is they immediately go out to the students by email. So students feel like you are in the class with them. Every couple of days they seem to be hearing from you and they know that, that you're engaged. And I found too that because they get a copy of this in, in email, they seem more willing, more comfortable emailing me because they are receiving emails from me. So I, I think that announcements open up a line of communication too. All right, and the question I see from Katie about discussion boards is perfect because I also grabbed a screenshot of one of my discussions. And you'll see I blurred out the names for privacy. But I think this is a good representation of how much I, I am involved in the discussion. So Katie is wondering if I have a goal for my discussions. And well, I'll ask you, what do you think? Let's use, uh, let's use the, the poll, which is the last of those icons that are going across. This is the one that has a check mark in the box um, for check yes and no. Uh, do you think that you should respond to every student post in discussions? What do you think? Choose yes or no. Let's see what people think. I have some no's. I have some more no's. Yeah, nobody's saying yes. I said yes once, and I will never say yes again because it killed me. <laughs> if 
you try to respond to every post that your students make, you're going to be spending four times more time than you have for the class. Um, but also, I found that when I was responding too much, then my students started writing just to me and not to each other. So I think it is an important question to think about because you want to have a balance, right? And especially uh, for people who are typing in here saying how many students they have, yes, it's also a workload issue. You do not have time to respond to everybody's posts. But I don't think it's a good teaching either. Um, like Katie, I also try to respond to everybody in the icebreaker introductory forum only. So the first forum of the semester where they're introducing themselves, I get in there and say hello back to every single student. I don't spend a lot of time. It's not really detailed, but it's welcoming and friendly. That's the only time I respond to everybody. After that, I try to mirror what I do in the classroom, really. So if we're having a class discussion, I don't make every single student say something and then I respond to every single student because that would, that would really kill the discussion. It would make it too mechanical. So in a class online, some students are saying the same things. So I might respond to one of them and reference a few other people and say, just like so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so said, this comment really shows us whatever. And so I think that's a good way to bring a few people in. Um, also, I try to choose a variety of topics so that I'm not always responding kind of repetitively saying the same thing. So people who have unique ideas, I will respond to those. People who have questions, I'll respond to those. Um, and also, as people are talking about in the chat, there are some, some posts that don't really need a response from you. Um, they have some small talk in them. Uh, they have um, something that, that is an idea that they're confident about and they, they don't feel like they need the feedback. And if they're right, I'll, I'll let, that, let that be something that other students can respond to. So what I try to do is I try to facilitate the discussions so that they know that I'm there, they know that I'm monitoring and reading their ideas, and they know that I will be joining some of those conversations, but not every single one. So if you look at the one that I'm spotlighting here, you notice it starts out with this person's what I call the primary post. That's the, the core post of, of the week. And then we have another student responding. And then I jump in there. And then another student jumps in. And then another student jumps in. So I'm part of the conversation, but I'm not dominating it. And then what is the other thing you notice in how I'm writing my response? If you compare that to the others, notice it's a lot shorter, right? Just like in the classroom. If we're talking more than the students, then we're not, we're not working with their ideas anymore. So I keep it short, and I always try to ask leading questions. So um, I start out by saying, great connections to the student, and then I ask a couple of questions. And then the students who come after me in this discussion can answer those questions. So it gives them a little bit more to talk about in this conversation. So that's how I try to structure my presence in the online classroom, in the online discussion. Sometimes, especially early in the semester, people need a little more guidance. Um, as the semester goes on and people get a sense of what needs to be done and how to do it, and they, they have a little more confidence in their ideas, they actually need me less. But I'm always there. So every week I am posting. Um, but it, who I respond to changes and um, how I respond changes too, depending on the week in the semester and depending on what they need. Yeah, I'm, I'm just kind of skimming through what people are saying here too. Um, yeah, uh, good job. This is when students are responding to each other. Yes, yeah, students are tempted just to say good job without um, actually discussing the ideas. So uh, as somebody mentioned in the chat window, having a minimum uh, word count is helpful. I do that as well. So their primary post has a word count requirement, and their responses to each other do too. And I also talk about what types of things they need to say. And in fact, I give them examples too. Here's what an A post looks like. Here's what a B post looks like. If you want to check any of that out, uh, those things are all in the model class that you'll find in Blackboard under the faculty support tab. So the conversation I, I've taken here is from that same class, although the model classroom doesn't have any students in it. So the, the key thing with the discussion is be there, be present, be positive, but don't take over. 
and we don't really have time to take over either. As, as we have talked about here, um, TC online takes time and having discussions online takes time. So you want to be careful and deliberate about how much you're responding and just make sure that your responses are really furthering the conversation and are happening throughout the week too. So I try to ch pop into my discussions each day and maybe leave a couple of comments each day. And that way they see that I'm there throughout the week. So does anyone else have any other ideas for, for ways to manage a discussion and encourage the students to keep, keep in, uh, contributing to those discussions too? Yep, lots of instructions as Felicity is saying is definitely important. Um, for, for some students when they see a discussion board, they think of a chat room or they think of texting and they start typing things that are not really academic language or academic focus. So yes, having some expectations spelled out, having some examples, having a rubric, those are all great ways to quickly get them up to speed about what they should be doing. Um, Pam is asking what kinds of things are in uh, a grading rubric. Mine has a section for the technical requirements, how long it needs to be, um, depending on the class, perhaps using MLA format, and proofreading the post. So those are all the technical requirements. And then I also have one for their ideas, for the quality of their ideas. So I break the primary post down into those two parts. And then I also give points for the responses. And I require them to provide two responses during the week. So those things all have um, a home on the rubric that I use. Okay, so I'm going to move on to another thing for us to think about. Um, what we talked about so far are very common and popular tools in Blackboard, but I wanted to briefly introduce you to a couple of other discussion tools that are really great for building that contact with your students. Um, and one of them is VoiceThread. VoiceThread is a third-party tool. Um, there is a very limited free account. You can, have, you can create three of these in the free account. Um, there's also a paid account. Um, which is what I ended up moving to because I just love this tool. Um, but the free account, you, you can make each one of those three as big as you want to, so you can conceivably have one for a class and use it the whole semester through. But VoiceThread is a place where students can come to discuss their ideas, but they do it in a much more visually rich space. So they can leave text comments just like they would on a discussion board. They also can record their voice and leave an audio comment or they can leave a video comment. So when the students choose, you get a nice variety of them um, that populate each one of these slides. And the other thing is, because it's slide-based, it, it's centered around something visual. So it's a really nice way for students to, to think about a discussion outside of just text. And for students who take a lot of online courses, which tend to be very text-heavy, this is a really nice breath of fresh air. I mean, it's also good for students who have a difficult time processing text alone. So my students have loved VoiceThread. Um, they do have to create a free account, and they do have to learn how to use it, but they have told me over and over that that's worth it and that they really are, are hoping to see more of this in their classes. So I can't show it to you because it does involve video, and that doesn't convey well in Confer. So I thought instead I'd show you a couple of examples here. So what you see in the middle, is basically a PowerPoint slide. And I've uploaded it to VoiceThread. And then what you see on the left here are the comments that will start showing up on the side of the slide. So the first one is for me. And as you can see, I am leaving a video comment just introducing the topic to my students. Then I have been giving a text equivalent of that comment. So I'll also put a text version so that uh, people who are using screen readers for accessibility will still be able to access that comment. But as you can see, we also can now close caption videos and audios in VoiceThread. So that's another way that you can make your comments accessible. Um, then uh, students will come in and they will leave their comments as well until you have comments um, lining up here below the original ones. And I'll show you what one looks like when you have several comments in there. Um, so this is one, as you can see, this, this 
program also has a doodle tool. So somebody started to circle the word doodle here. And uh, some of these people might even look familiar to you. This is from a training session that we did over the summer. And you can see that as their, uh, their comments come in, their icons come in as well. So if we were to click on one of these icons in VoiceThread, we'd be able to see and hear their comment. And they can also um, draw on the image. So what I'm giving them here is an activity where I want them to find and show us the optical illusions, the hidden faces in the picture. But think about how you could use this for an art history class or a science class uh, where you want them to notice things in the image. You can put videos in here as well. You could also put text in there. You can put, uh, as I said, PowerPoint slides. So there's a lot you can do with this tool, and all of it is discussion. And it embeds in, into Blackboard so students can actually work on this within Blackboard if they choose to, or they can go out to the VoiceThread site. And I also thought I would throw this in as well. I give my students surveys every semester, a couple of times during the semester, and ask them what's working for them, what they like, what they don't like, what suggestions they have. And this is just a random copy and paste from one of those surveys. So I haven't collected these. These are just ones that happen to be next to each other. Look at these five in a row that all mention VoiceThread as something they like. So I highlighted just so you can see it there, but these five comments in a row are all about VoiceThread. So students really, really value it. Um, they get really energized when they're given some options and they're allowed to see and hear each other. And they really value being able to feel like they're with other people, real people, not just types, not just typing, but, but hearing uh, and seeing their classmates and their instructor. So that's something that, that you might want to consider playing around with. Um, at this point, yeah, as people have said, one drawback is it is not free like a lot of the other tools um, that we are talking about. Um, the one I'm going to show you next is a free tool. Um, but VoiceThread, in my mind, is worth paying for. Um, but it would be, it, it's something that I would love to talk about getting for our campus, for the entire campus. Okay, so here's another one. Uh, Lisa says, do students have to pay for it? No. Students uh, are given free accounts, and that means they can make up to three of these as well. So I've had students choose to use VoiceThread for projects because they, with their account, they can make their own. And that's wonderful because they get to present to their classmates, and their classmates can leave comments and feedback within their presentation. So students. Students um, get their account. They can have up to three. They can use it in the next semester. If, if a future instructor uses VoiceThread, they can use the same account. Uh, and Lydia is asking about Skype. Uh, I have used Skype in the past uh, for office hours and for small groups with students. Um, it gets a little unwieldy when a lot of people are in there, but instructor accounts do let you have um, conversations with multiple students. Okay, so the next one here is Padlet. And Padlet is a free tool. It's not quite as, as feature rich as um, VoiceThread, but it's really easy to use. And it's a fun, quick way to get people to contribute ideas. So the one I'm showing you here is from an English class, not mine actually, but uh, this one was asking students to go out into the world and find examples of grammatically incorrect or awkward sentences. They were asked to take pictures of signs, to find something on a website, to find a video. And this is not even the entire thing, but some of what the students found. And as you can see, this is really fun to look through. Right? So there are lots of different examples. Some of them are things like a tag from um, a piece of clothing. Somebody took a picture of a sign, a couple of signs. Um, somebody included a Charlie Sheen video clip. Uh, there are all sorts of different examples here. And so that's one of the nice things about Padlet is you can, you can post your ideas in text or image images, I should say, or um, with video. And it's very easy to use. In fact, it is so easy to use that I thought maybe we would try it out. So I have created a Padlet for us to play around with, and then you can watch as it populates. So 
we have the confer window open. If you open a browser on your computer and you type in the URL you see at the top, or you simply click on the link that I just put in the chat window, you will come to this screen. So you can simply click on that link in the pat in the chat window and it should take you right there. And then once you're there, I will join you. Okay, so I just switched over to application sharing, which means I am out on the internet as well. Clearly Pam is here. Not Kilroy. Oh, Pam, we're dating ourselves because I know exactly what you're talking about. So uh, once you get here, see if you can figure out how to use it. I just want you to see how easy it is. So it's a blank wall, and you're going to leave your note on the wall. Think about what you would logically do to leave a note on that wall. Oh, there we go. So there are different ways to do it, but one of the easiest ways is just to simply click. Just do a click or a double click, and you'll see a box that comes up, and you can write in the box, or you could add different multimedia features into that box. And those are the little buttons that you see down at the bottom. So imagine how fun this would be for students. Yep, and it's super easy, and it is absolutely free. You can use a paid account if you want to have some more options for the background, but there are probably 20 backgrounds that you can choose from with the free version, so I really never felt the need to upgrade. And I can rearrange these if I want to. So if I wanted to group them by ideas and put similar ideas together, I could do that. I can also arrange them. Not sure what that was. Uh, I can also arrange them. Oh, look, somebody's got some images coming in. Uh, I can arrange them automatically as well. So if you click on, as you can see on the right hand side, there are a bunch of options here. Um, if you click on them, you can see these are all the different images you can have up at the top. Um, you can choose what layout. So right now we're putting it in free form, but if I want to make it into a grid, they organize themselves into a grid. I can choose the wallpaper that I want. So if I want it to look like a blueprint instead, I could do that. Or a map. Or a chalkboard. Lots of different options here. So this is something that as the creator of it, I would have the ability to do. The students would not. But I can control what it looks like by doing that. And so while you're playing with that, I'm going to get to a question that came up in the chat window, which is, can you see this from Blackboard? Well, I'm going to click over to Blackboard for you. Look at that. That's in Blackboard. So here's our Padlet. It's populating in real time in Blackboard. And all I've done is embed it. I just created an item in Blackboard. I embedded the Padlet. And now as things change, it changes here in Blackboard too. And if I wanted to contribute to this from Blackboard, then I could actually do that as well. I can work with it in here if I want to. I can play around with the, the settings because I have that permission. I can bring it back to freeform. So I can work with it right from within Blackboard. So pretty fun tool, huh? Okay, I am going to pop back into Confer, where we still have our, our sad blank wall, because that was just an image. So on uh, the slide that you see now, I have highlighted in yellow the tools that we have used or discussed today. And then I've highlighted in purple tools that are coming up in the training that we have scheduled for this semester. So we are going to be talking about blogs 
at a workshop, an on-campus workshop on September 29th. Henry Aronson will be there talking about how he uses blogs in his class. I've actually had some of his students after that class, and uh, the reason I know what he does is because his students rave about it. Um, there also are going to be some opportunities to think about how you can give feedback on student work. Uh, there is a workshop that I'll be presenting on video feedback, how you can use video to give your students feedback on their work right within Blackboard. And I'll be going over that in a campus face-to-face -face version as well as a webinar version. Uh, the face-to-face -face for video feedback will be on November 5th, and the webinar version will be sooner on October 14th. So we'll have a chance to talk about different ways that you can um, take your feedback up a notch at that one. And also, since we are almost to 1 o'clock, I wanted to let you know about the next webinar in the series, which is on accessibility. And the part I've highlighted in blue in the description is what we'll be focusing on mostly during that session. So we're going to talk about what you can do to make documents accessible and what you can do to make the images in, that you're using in your classes accessible. And also we'll talk about video captioning as well. Video captioning has gotten so much easier. And so we'll talk about how to do that. And um, when we're talking about the documents, uh, there are a few easy things that you can do from the very beginning of creating your documents that make them much more accessible for students once they're um, added into Blackboard. So we'll walk you through that. I'll give you some examples. Um, and then we'll also talk about how you can put an alt tag on your images to make those images accessible in Blackboard too. So those are really the big three in accessibility for online classes right now. So we'll be going through all three of them. And I'll give you a ton of resources too. Many of the workshops that I have in the webinar series match up. Not all of them, but many of them match up with the face-to-face. So that whichever format works better for people, um, they'll have that available to them. Not all of them work that way, especially the ones where I have guest speakers. Um, but you'll find that most of the ones that I'm doing, I am doing again in both forms so that we, we all can have access to them. And I love webinars. I think they're really fun. And, and it's great to interact with everybody online. After all, that's where we teach, right? So it's great to have some teacher talk online as well. So um, we are just about to the end, but I wanted to give you a reminder that if you are uh, going to be asking for flex credit for this webinar, that the evaluation was sent out as an attachment to your emailed invitation. And you just need to fill that out and send that back to Patty in the Professional Development Office to, um, I, I believe that's the last step that you would need to do to get your flex credit. And I'm going to ignore Frank's where's the joke question because unfortunately, Frank, while I had many, many great jokes lined up, I think we're out of time. So I guess we'll have to wait until next time for the jokes. So um, any last questions we can stick around for a few minutes to discuss. Uh, I'm going to stop the recording at this point, and then I will stick around uh, for a few minutes as long as other people would like to stick around to chat. So thank you very much for joining me for this webinar. And if you have any questions, you can always contact me uh, using my college email. Or you can drop by one of the instructional design hours I have, either on campus or online. All the information for the instructional design hours can be found in Blackboard on the Faculty Support tab. All right, thanks everybody. <laughs>